Well, good morning again. Again, I want to say a special thank you and welcome to those who are first-time guests at The Journey. I hope you are uh, glad to be worshiping with us today. We are glad that you're worshiping here as well. Uh, Last week, I was out. I got the chance to go and baptize my best friend's baby up in North North Texas uh, and our good friend and now lay pastor and young adult and families director, uh, Victor Resendez, led us last week as we talked about the older brother in the story of the prodigal son. He's here today. Can we give him a quick hand? Because I think it was awesome. Seriously. He did a really good job. And I loved at the end of his sermon where he was like, can y'all just like for real? Oh, hey, Victor, are you just walking down the middle right now? Because sit down, Victor. Thank you. Oh, try to give a guy a compliment and he walks in right in the... Um, uh, Yeah, I love how he said last week, uh, uh, pray for me, because he's starting this journey of ministry. I know about that start of ministry uh, and that journey through seminary as he begins this fall. So if you see him in the hallway or you see him out in the lobby, um, uh, remind yourself to pray for him during the week and give him a hug and say, you you can do it, because it's really helpful. Uh, And it's true. We are uh, now in the last week of this three-week series called Lost and Found, looking at the story of the prodigal son. Uh, And each week we've been reading from uh, the gospel of Luke, chapter 15, a great chapter to read uh, throughout the book of Luke. Um, And uh, we're going to read verses 11 through 32 and hear that story again. Um, Today, I want you, when you're hearing the story read to you and you're reading the words, pay attention to the father's actions in this story, Uh, because today we're going to hone in on what the father does in this parable. So hear these words from uh, Holy Scripture. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of the country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. While he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out to go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate tonight. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. And meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called out to one of his servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go inside. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and you never never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother's, brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. My friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. And together we say, thanks be to God. Amen. So uh, this past week, Uh, I attended a a quarterly gathering uh, of uh, young pastors called uh, Advancing Pastoral Leadership. 
uh, and we call it Apple for short. Uh, and it's four days, and we meet at Camp Allen in Navasota. And what Apple is, is it's a gathering of young pastors uh, for five years, and we learn about leadership skills that we're going to need for the future of the church. Uh, and it's a, it's a great gathering of folks. And uh, in my cohort, my team, are two pastors named Brandy and David Horton. And they are pastors here in the Houston area. And most recently, they gave birth to their very first daughter named Caroline. And uh, our supervisor, uh, kind of head of Apple named Janice Virtue, Janice, uh, actually gave them the thumbs up to attend this year's, this uh, kind of month's Apple with little Caroline in hand. And needless to say, the oohs and ahs that came and bellowed from that room as she got strollered in were infectious. In fact, I'm pretty sure she made 18 honorary uh, uh, uncles and aunts uh, this past week as we embraced her and loved her as she was there. So on the very last day, as we gathered together, Janice said, I have a surprise for you. We are going to go to College Station Okay, one little whoop. That's, that's, I guess I was expecting a little bit more from the Aggies in the room. Um, uh, we're going to go to the college station, and we're going to participate in an escape room. Uh, anyone in this room ever done an escape room before? A little show of hands. One, two. Okay, there's more. There's more. Okay, yeah. Yeah, not me. Um, personally, uh, getting locked in a room and trying to find out a combination doesn't sound like fun uh, to me uh, in any way, shape, or form. I'd like to know how to get out of rooms, personally. So I was a little afraid, <laughs> to be honest with you. But luckily, Brandy Horton, who was in my small group to go into the uh, escape room, uh, was able to kind of calm me down, bring me back uh, to earth. And she was like, it's just a game, Jarbo. It's going to be fine. Brandy has a gift for doing that. Me and her uh, husband are both extroverts. So our head are up in the clouds most of the time. Like, what could happen? Could we get locked in forever? Are we ever going to get out? And she's like, just chill. It's going to be fine. And it was. So we got into the room, and we had 60 minutes on the clock to break out of the room and using all sorts of encryptions and codes and combinations and uh, multiplication uh, mathematical problems, all this stuff, we were finally able to find out the evil spy's encryption password. And we went up to the door and beep, 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 and put it in and opened it, and we got out in 57 minutes. Come on, clap for me, people. Let's go. <laughs> Y'all, it was gratifying, for real. Like, I'm not going to be taken out by a spy today. Yay! Like, this is like a little, it's a little victories, right? We all gave each other high fives and made our way out to the lobby. So we were out in the lobby, and uh, we noticed a few minutes in that Brandy was nowhere to be found. Kind of ran back to the, the room where we were just in. She wasn't there. Kind of looked, at where, where's Brandy? No one knew. And then uh, a few minutes later, Brandy kind of turned the corner, and you could tell on her face that there was something a little different. And she looked at us and she goes, kind of mumbled, I can't find Janice or Caroline anywhere. And in that moment, like the mood completely shifted, right? It wasn't a game anymore, as Brandy had told us in that room. So we began running around looking in different places. We checked bathrooms and hallways that we hadn't been. We looked really everywhere. We asked the front desk receptionist. She was clueless and had no idea where they might have gone. We kept checking other places, but there was, there was nowhere they could be. I mean, we told Janice to stay right here in the lobby, be here, and she wasn't. By that time, David had gotten out of his escape room and was coming down the hallway, and spouses in the room will know, you know, you can see your spouse, and they make a look, and you honestly, and, and right there, know something's up. You know what I'm talking about? And David could just instantly tell, like, oh, something is up. And he went and embraced Brandy, and just before she, he did, the door of the embrace, uh, the embrace room, the escape room opened wide up, and in walks in Janice with a sleeping Caroline in her arms. The minute Brandy had walked in that escape room with me and my team, she started bawling. And to get some fresh air and hopefully calm her down, Janice had gone to a courtyard behind the escape room to kind of mellow her out. Didn't really tell anybody, but she, thankfully, was safe. And all of our crew let out a unanimous sigh of relief. You know, I, I have no idea what kind of soul-crushing feeling one must experience 
when they have misplaced a child or when one has gone lost. But in those few stressful minutes I was there, and I'm not even the mom or dad of little Caroline, that feeling was nothing I'd wish upon my greatest enemy. You hear about that story all the time, right? People losing track of their children, maybe at a mall or at a park. They're running around that park trying to find them, and it turns out they're just swinging on the same swing they first left them. (laughs) Or maybe the, the child has walked away, and a nice employee at the mall sees them and says, where's your mommy and daddy? Tells them, and over the intercom system at the mall, you hear, uh, where your kid is, and you go and pick them up. Maybe that's happened to some of you in this room today. I learned something more valuable that that escape room this past Thursday than anything uh, about teamwork and trying to get out of a, uh, a room with a code. I learned that day in College Station that when it comes down to it, it is a vulnerable thing to have a child. I'm not a parent yet. But I certainly have parents, and I've watched, especially as I've gotten older, the depth of their anxiety and desire for control when we got older and wanted to run out and do different things. They wanted us in their presence. They wanted to reach out their arm and be able to take us when they needed to. Maybe some of you are actually going through that right now, right? Your child next week is about to start middle school, leaving the safe confines of Rummel Creek and going off to Memorial Middle or wherever it might be. That scares you. And those going off to high school is scary. And then to imagine what's even wilder is that your kid is going to leave the safety of Memorial and go off to another college, a university far away. Those emotions are there. And let's be honest. I see y'all on Instagram and on Facebook. You guys are hyperventilating when you're dropping off your kid to the bus stop in kindergarten, right? Those videos of (laughs) while you're watching your kid make his way. You get freaked out too, even when they're this small. But let's be honest, friends. Whether you create or adopt a child, you make yourself vulnerable to a broken heart when you have a child, in a way that nothing else can describe. Which made me think this week about the vulnerability of God, that God would breathe into dust and create us in God's own image, that God would would bring humanity into existence to look like God's own beloved child was like to be vulnerable, to open their heart up to being broken by making us and creating us. I mean, have you ever made that connection before? Friends, what a risk it was for God to create you and me, giving us the freedom to be our own creators, our own restorers, our own destroyers of the world in which we live, giving us the ability to to mess up everything that we want to or perhaps become like our own little gods, just wielding our power and our pride anywhere we can. And yet somehow with some great hope, God's greatest desire for us is that we might be more like him, more like God in all that we do, to love God and to love our neighbors as was intended. Don't forget Jesus, y'all. Remember, Jesus was not born in some palace as a king or some great, mighty person. No, Jesus was born in a stable in Bethlehem, on the outskirts of town, in the arms of a teenage girl named Mary. God allowed God's self to enter into the world, not as a prince, but as a child, the most vulnerable creature that could possibly be to share in our experience, to grow up and teach us how we might live day by day, and then to die the death of a criminal. And like any good parent, I think that God lost a part of God's self on that cross, on that Good Friday. God knows. God knows what it's like to be vulnerable, y'all. In fact, God embodied vulnerability through Jesus and through you and me. 
And I wonder if that's what Jesus was trying to get at with the parable of the prodigal son. I wonder. If you were here two weeks ago, uh, as we, I talked about the younger son, you remember me giving some different names for the prodigal son story, right? Sometimes it's called the prodigal of the lost brothers or the prodigal of the, uh, of the, uh, the two brothers. And then my favorite is the prodigal of the dysfunctional family because <laughs> that kind of works there. Um, we don't use that word prodigal very much in our daily talk uh, unless we're describing maybe this parable, right? The prodigal um, of, the, of the son. Um, and I always thought, for some reason, that prodigal meant uh, righting wrongs, right? Its definition was righting wrongs or something having to do with um, your intelligence or even your stupidity for a while, and then you come back and make things right. Like, for example, using the sentence, Michael was a prodigal freshman year of college, right? That would have been like my understanding of what I I may have understood. But then if you actually open the book, I'm talking the dictionary, and you read it, you find out what prodigal really means, you learn that prodigal doesn't mean that so much. What the definition says, it means spending resources freely or recklessly. Or the second definition was the act of being wastefully extravagant. Wastefully extravagant. So the younger son was wastefully extravagant. I mean, that's good to get your facts straight when you think about it. Uh, But when you look at the story through that lens, not the most interesting parable in the world, right? I mean, we We see that example all the time in today's world where kids go and take their inheritance they're given from a grandma or grandpa and they use it and spend it in foolish ways, right? I mean, that might as well be called the parable of first world problems if we look at it in that right light. But I wonder, now knowing what we know about the prodigal and the definition of that and translating it to wastefully extravagant, then isn't this the parable of the prodigal father? I mean, think about it. Isn't it wastefully extravagant for the father to give his children so much freedom? Isn't it wastefully extravagant for the father to toss away his dignity and his pride and to go running out into the street to his foolish and immature child who has squandered his family inheritance? I mean, think about it. Isn't it wastefully extravagant for the father to throw such a community-wide festival of feast, getting the nicest piece of steak he can possibly find, basically handing over his designer robe and jewelry, all for this wayward son who runs back home not hoping to be a son, but just to be a hired hand? I mean, if we really think about it, y'all, the whole story is crazy. Really is, right? Think about the father. I mean, some might even go to the extent that says the father has reached a point of insanity. Right? Maybe in his old age and his fragile state, so sad that his son has done all these things, he's lost his marbles, right? And just gone ahead and given everything away and, and now is coming and forgiving this son. Or perhaps he was this once respected and sensible man in the community, and now everyone's talking about nope, nope. He's lost it, y'all. Stay away from that guy. But you know, now that I know that definition of wastefully extravagant, for me, what really gets me in this story is how wastefully extravagant he was to the older son, the kid who never left him, the one who was always, who had always done everything right. The, the kid who was clean cut and, and went off to uh, college right out of high school and then came back and worked for his family's business. The kid who signed up for chores up at church or at the synagogue and worked to clean up the place, whatever the pastor needed. And then he saw some kids off in the distance who, who wouldn't do their work but still would get the praise and the prize. The kid who feels entitled. The kid who can't stomach the possibility of going to this screw-up of a brother's party. I can't stand the older brother, y'all, especially looking at him from that image that Victor showed us last night or last week from Rembrandt's painting. You remember that? That image? Here it is. Yeah, right? I mean, look at the older brother. 
just staring there. You can almost feel the, the pain, the, the, the judgment pouring out of the older brother in this image. I mean, I think when that younger brother down on his knees, embraced by the father, when he looks up, he, the older brother's either going to clock him <laughs> or give him a look of anger that will last for years. All that frustration, all that anger built up within him, and yet he's done all these good things in his mind, and he still won't get the prize. He still won't get the recognition that he so wants. And yet I think I cringe the most at the older brother because I see myself most like him in the story. And maybe you do too. See, friends, you know what's wastefully extravagant in this story? Is that the prodigal son walks over to the older brother and he says, all that I have is yours. In fact, you've always had everything I have. And when I reflect on this story, y'all, I think each of us have been the younger son a time or two. We've wanted to get away from our home lives, run as far away from our parents as we can. Then we become ashamed by our own mistakes, willing to do whatever it takes to go back to our old lives. And at the same time, I think we've also been the older brother, hardworking, diligent, and then resentful at the unprecedented and unworthy gift that that younger brother gets. And as I keep reading this story throughout this three weeks, y'all, I like to think that the father actually knew what each son was feeling in their particular time of struggle, of pain, of anger. And although Jesus doesn't paint it or say it in the story as he tells his audience, I can only imagine that the father knows what these kids are feeling like because the father sees himself in each of the sons. Jesus doesn't tell us that in the parable. But maybe he gets a glimpse of his past in each one of those sons. Because I know the fathers and mothers and guardians and grandparents who love and nurture their children with all of their heart. And in each one of those kids, a bit of their parents, a bit of their guardians rubs off on them. It's in being vulnerable that the father can actually see those pieces come together and in return, show grace to his sons. I remember like it was yesterday, me and my dad were going to Six Flags over Texas. It was a boy's night out and we were heading over to Six Flags and I was a child, probably eight or nine years old. And, uh, I loved roller coasters, but y'all, for some reason that day, I wanted a stuffed animal to take home with me. And as we were walking through the arcades, I came across a huge Bugs Bunny. And I think the Bugs Bunny doll like whispered to me like, Michael, do you want me? And I'm looking at the bunny like, yeah, 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 yeah. You, you, you're the one. And so I looked there and said, Dad, I want to play this game. It was that game that you play with the little rings and you, um, you toss them and you try to get them over the long neck bottles. And if it lands and you get the prize, right? Easy as that. And I went to my dad and said, Dad, can I have a buck? Of course. Gave a buck, got a kind of a bucket of rings and just can toss and toss and toss. And I kept missing over and over again. And I just, Dad, another, another dollar? Yes. And it kept going over and over again. Eventually, I kept missing so much. Uh, my dad sort of acted as a cheerleader and an ATM machine in those moments, right? He was just, doosh, doosh, and I'm just kind of throwing and trying, and nothing is working until finally my dad says, Michael, I don't have any more dollar bills. Let's go ride a roller coaster instead. But something deep within my bones said no, and I began to weep hysterically. I was that kid at Six Flags, y'all. And I think I turned around and just like one of those, uh, turned around. My dad was long gone. Like, I think he probably ran back to the parking lot, got home, went to my mother and was like, he'll make it home, probably. I hope. Arlington and Irving are not too far away. It'll be fine. Uh, It'll be safe. And I looked around, he was nowhere to be found. 
But then before I could turn back around towards the game, I felt the embrace of a big stuffed animal behind me, and I turned around, and it was my dad holding Bugs Bunny. And I held that Bugs Bunny, who was the size of me, like it was my own son, <laughs> and embraced him. And I put the Bugs Bunny down, and I went up, and I, I, I hugged my dad so tight. And I said, Dad, how? I mean, was I really crying that long? Is that how you were able to go... Go to the ATM machine, get a few bucks and throw some. How'd you do it? He goes, Michael, it's no big deal. It's yours, son. Just enjoy it. I didn't take that for an answer. Show me your technique, Dad. Come on. What did you do? Which one of those did you hone in on? Just please tell me what to do next time. I want to do this next time, but thank you. My dad goes, and he kind of sighed. He goes, well, if you really want me to tell you, as I gave you that last dollar, I looked down the row, and there was an older high school student who had just thrown a winning ring and won the Bugs Bunny. And I walked over, asked him how much it cost, how how much I could give him for it, gave him 20 bucks, and now the bunny is yours. Why would he do that? I mean, that is crazy, right? I mean, my dad could have used that $20 on so many other things, maybe lunch that next week. Perhaps giving it to a homeless person. I mean, it couldn't have cost six flags more than a few dollars to make. Why would he spend $20 on that? That sounds crazy. But you know, friends, the more I think about it, it was because watching his sons work so hard, so determined to succeed, and then to watch me struggle, I think he saw himself in me. And he wanted to help me out the way he wished he could have been helped out when he was my age. Some would call that wastefully extravagant. But I would call that my dad. So, how are we to be like the father in the story? of the prodigal son, of the prodigal father. I think we got some good illustrations here from this parable that Jesus tells, some good characters. But one thing that I can take from the father's point of view is that we cannot define people or put them into boxes based on their past mistakes or something someone said about them or even their good virtues or even this weekend because of the color of their skin. We can't do that, friends. And that takes becoming vulnerable. It takes allowing yourself to see that person, not for the label that's attached to their name or their status or whatever they come from, but to see them as what they truly are from the beginning, what each of us are, who are precious children of God. What a risk God took on creating you and me especially in the world at this particular time that we live and inhabit it. But if you notice at the very end, Jesus leaves the parable kind of open-ended, right? He talks to his kids and talks to his older son and says, you're welcome to come in. But we don't know what happens, right? We don't know if the kids actually went into the party or if they stayed there in the dust pouting about their experience and about themselves. We don't know. But what I do know is that each of us, like those sons, have an invitation to the banquet table. (laughs) We have an invitation to the party, to the Father's party, to God's party. All of us are welcome. And hear this as well. You were worth the risk to God. Did you hear that? You were worth the risk to God. And so today, friends, I hope that you hear that that invitation is still on the table, that you are welcome in. So friends, come and celebrate and truly feel the embrace of God. When you felt lost, now know that you are found. May it be so. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, for the gift of your Holy Spirit, 
with the story of the prodigal son seen in so many lights and in different angles that you can find and, and take something new from it every time you read it. That's the goodness of parables and the way that Jesus teaches his people. May we this week see ourselves like a father. See ourselves like a good father who embraces those regardless of what they've done, regardless of who they say they are, and see them truly as they are, which is a child of God. That takes work. That takes being vulnerable. But thankfully, we have your spirit to guide us to that place. That's our prayer today, O oh Lord. Praise things in Christ's holy name. Amen.